Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call the Honourable David Cunliffe. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to comment on the member who's just resumed his seat because, as usual, there's nothing much to comment on in what he said. I am going to comment, however, on the Minister's opening comments as follows. Firstly, the Minister's, uh, mis well, perhaps not misled in the technical sense, but certainly uh, pulled the wool over the public's eyes in several key respects. He said that uh, Chorus will maintain the Kiwi share obligation on telecom. That's factually incorrect in, in two respects. One, it's only entering into a contract called the Telecommunications Service Obligation, uh, not the Kiwi share, and Chorus is not equivalent to the whole of telecom, which is currently covered by the existing Kiwi share. He said that uh, there would be open access, but then contradicted himself by admitting plainly to the House exactly what the Labour opposition has been saying, which is that the weaker standard of access, called non-discrimination, applies across the board, but the strongest standard, called equivalence of inputs, will only apply to some parts now and takes eight and a half years to apply to everything. That, sir, is not good enough for the New Zealand system. He said that uh, people would not be paying more for their existing telephone lines under mandatory de-averaging. Well, sir, the objective analysis that we have seen, both from the library and from uh, members of the industry, is that the average New Zealander will pay at least $5 a month more for the same service they are currently getting on their copper phone line. The reason that is being done is precisely to make it easier for them to shift, or less costly for them, to shift to a fibre-based service. Except they won't get the fibre, sir, in many cases for eight to ten years, and will be left paying a higher price for today's slow copper to subsidise telecom to roll out fibre eventually to some. So the minister then said he was unsure whether he was being described as too slow or too quick. I can help him on that. It took him two and a half years to think up a policy after being elected. He did not have a policy, sir. He had a slogan. So that bit was too slow. The bit that was too quick was the select committee process where he started out after two and a half years of going round in circles, giving the rest of the public and the industry only ten days to put together a submission. Two and a half years, ten days, pushed out, as Mr Lotheringham knows, by the select committee to three weeks. Either way, it was a travesty. And it wasn't an accident, sir. It was a deliberate tactic, tactic by the TSO minister, that is, the terribly slimy operator, the terribly slippery operator, to take as long as possible in the darkened rooms and to try to ramroad it through preventing the industry to have a decent opportunity to rebuttal. Sir, there are unanswered questions about taxes and there are unanswered questions about international obligations. We're the world's number one law firm at taking cases to the World Trade Organisation, issued an extensive opinion saying that New Zealand was in breach of its obligations because of a disguised subsidy to telecom. And you know what? We didn't get so much as the dignity of an opinion, a written opinion from this government. We had half a page, half a page from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and a file note from MED saying, oh, it doesn't matter, we were right. Well, that doesn't cut it, and the cost of that arrogance may well be a suit in front of the, T of the World Trade Organisation. And I want to frame the rest of my comments, sir, using precisely the objectives that the Minister himself called the House to mind. Firstly, the cost to build. He says this was cheap. This is not cheap. The purpose clause of the current Act talks about the long-run benefits to consumers. What has happened here exactly as my colleague Claire Curran has said, is that $1.5 billion, not as a grant, not as a stimulus, 
but as a commercial investment seeking a commercial rate of return was never going to be within a bull's roar of sufficient to get 75 per cent of homes covered by ultra-fast broadband. Just look at the costs in Australia. So to solve that problem in the short term, they sold the law. Sold the law for before, between 30 pieces of silver. Does that sound familiar? Maybe we should call this the Judas Bill. They sold the law in this case for $400 to $600 million. And I give credit to Sir Roger Douglas for nailing the officials on that point. So for half a billion dollars extra, telecoms got its leverage over the law once again. Sir, it took a long time to sort that problem out. When we did sort it out, and it didn't come easy, sir, New Zealand rocketed up the international broadband rankings. After two and a half years of dithering by Stephen Joyce and an anti-democratic parliamentary process, Mr Joyce has managed to tumble us down those rankings again. This national government once again has proved itself out of touch and out of ideas when it comes to high tech. They just don't do it too well, do they? In terms of cost to consumers, he said prices would generally be competitive. Well, sir, no, they're not competitive today. People are paying too much now for their copper, five bucks a month at least, and they'll be paying too much for their fibre because the disciplines to keep it competitiveness keep it competitive have been fatally weakened. Imagine taking the cop off the beat for 10 years. The 10-year regulatory holiday. What an obscenity to good governance that was. What a preposterous idea. How could we imagine a responsible minister bringing to the New Zealand Parliament an idea that we would take the hard-fought protections of the consumer away for a decade. What a ridiculous, what a laughable suggestion. So ridiculous that the minister was in a minority of one. Only Telecom backed him. And when his friends deserted him, he called in the Maori party to provide a fig leaf so he could back off it. What a backdown it was. When he changed his mind and Telecom complained, he came up with an indemnity to Telecom, funded by the taxpayer, that if they got caught out by the regulator in future and had to drop their price, they wouldn't pay the difference. The taxpayer, mum and dad Kiwi, who were already paying the phone bill, would have to pay a bigger tax bill as well. That is an appalling precedent, Mr Speaker, an appalling precedent, and this parliament is the worst for it. Our statute books are the worst for it. Mr Speaker, I want to sort of draw in this third reading the debate together with some form of conclusion. This is bad law, sir. It lacks a good strategic context. It says nothing about the ability of every New Zealander to hook up. By raising costs and prices, it means new low-income Kiwis, those on the wrong side of the digital divide, are now even further behind. Secondly, it weakens fatally the regulatory framework, particularly at the wholesale level, particularly at the crucial layer zero ducts, layer one dark fibre where the proper disciplines of equivalence of inputs do not apply on fibre for eight and a half years. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this represents a covert backroom deal with the dominant player in the industry where, strangely enough, not even the Minister will know until after the Telecom Board has decided the nature of the split, which assets are going where and what the final shape of the deal would be like. Great for the interests of shareholders, not great for the interests of consumers. Back to the future, one suspects. It's set back confidence in the industry already. The damage has already been done. It won't take 10 years to realise that damage. The industry now has started to shut down. What would a rational policy have looked like? It would have said, we need to get fibre in the ground to take New Zealand forward. We want to get as many players as possible contributing. So we want an inclusive framework, not an exclusive one, where they bid one against another and only telecom gets to play. An inclusive process would have got the most investment from the most players to build the most 
fibre as fast as possible. That is the opposite of the outcome of this bill. Consumers get a worse deal than they need to get today and their losses will accumulate over the 10 years. And it leaves unanswered the crucial questions for the future. How will we get all New Zealanders onto the net and how will we ensure free access to content? Are we building a new monopoly for Sky TV? That is the next chapter of this sorry saga.